Educational Interviewing for Home Health Part 1 Conference Call. My name is John and I'll be your operator for today's call. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. During the question and answer session, if you do have a question, press star then 1 on your touchtone phone. And now, I'll turn the call over to Ashley Green. All right. Thanks so much, John, and good afternoon, everyone. This is Ashley Green. I'm with Metastar in Madison, Wisconsin. We're one of three quality improvement organizations, including Impro in Michigan and Stratus Health in Minnesota, who make up the Lake Superior Quality Innovation Network. And we're happy to welcome you to the Motivational Interviewing for Home Health two-part webinar series today. Um, so for the agenda today, we're going to cover um, our speaker today, Mia, is going to cover a couple of things, uh, including the background and evidence base for MI, uh, the worldview and approach, kind of the spirit of MI, and then she'll discuss a partnership activity that you can do between the webinars um, to practice uh, some of those initial skills. A couple of quick housekeeping items for you. As always, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat box. If you want to uh, shoot those over to, to me and Mia uh, during the webinar, we'll monitor those. And of course, we'll have time at the end of the webinar for any questions you might want to ask as well. And, and by the way, because of some technical difficulties we've had in the past, uh, you'll notice that the live captioning doesn't automatically come up. But we've included a link in the chat box uh, to live captioning uh, in case we have any participants um, who are hearing impaired or otherwise require those uh, captions, so, so be aware of that. And so it's my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Mia Croyle. Uh, Mia has extensive experience using and helping others learn MI. She's a member of the Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers, or MINT, and she's facilitated a number of workshops for a diverse group of professionals across the country and, and certainly in our region, including Wisconsin. Mia has a master's in clinical mental health counseling from Valparaiso University, and I'm happy to report she's currently a behavioral health project specialist here at Metastar. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Mia. Thank you, Ashley, and thank you to all of you for joining us for um, our brief series, um, this webinar, and then one in two weeks on August 2nd, which uh, I have to say the fact that in two weeks it's August is giving me a little bit of um, uh, a little bit of pause because it still feels like we're in the very beginning of summer. So uh, thank you for taking some time out of what I know is your very busy days to think together a little bit about how motivational interviewing might be useful um, for the patients you serve and those you work with. Um, I just want to check in with the team. There's some questions in the chat box um, regarding getting volume. So if someone could reply to that participant and help her get connected with the audio, that would be great. Um, Ashley or Jennifer or whoever could do that, thank you. Um, so just to briefly get us started, um, as Ashley said, I work at Metastar, and I've had the pleasure of uh, learning motivational interviewing about 10 years ago. So I, I didn't, when I first initially um, started my career, I didn't learn about motivational interviewing. It was too new to be included in my coursework way back then. Um, but I've had the chance to really learn about it and experience the shift that happened in my practice when I started working with people using this approach. And so from my point of view, MI is a very powerful tool, both for helping other people and also, you know, for helping me reconnect to some of the joy in the work I did, um, because there certainly were some things that were frustrating about trying to help other people make positive behavior changes in their life. And I um, definitely got kind of caught up in some of that frustration at times. Some of you may relate to that as well. Um, and motivational interviewing really helped me make sense of some of that frustration and move forward in a productive way. So I hope that what I'm able to share with you over the course of these two webinars um, will be the beginning of, of that process for you as well. So our objectives um, over 
the whole series, so this webinar, the, the um, activities that we're inviting you to do in between the two webinars, as well as the, the second webinar on August 2nd, um, we're hoping to talk a little bit about the spirit of motivational interviewing and just to think a little bit about how that's similar to and different from some other approaches of working with other people and trying to help promote behavior change. Um, then we'll want to think about what are some of the key skills that we learn in motivational interviewing and one of the most particular, one of the most important skills is reflective listening. So we're going to work on developing a little bit of skillfulness in reflective listening and think about how you might work that into your day-to-day -day practice. And then I'm going to share with you a few different strategies that we use in MI and hopefully we can think together about how that might make sense for some of the work you do. And then also think a little bit about what resources are there and how might you access future learning if motivational interviewing seems like something that you want to continue the journey and the process of uh, learning and bringing into your, your work. So today um, on this part one webinar, we're going to talk a little bit about the background and the evidence base of motivational interviewing. We say that it's an evidence-based process. Um, so it's important to know kind of what does the evidence tell us, but I won't belabor the research too much. If you have any particular areas that you're curious about the research that I don't go into the details, you can certainly always um, respond uh, and send that request to me and I can get you connected with some more of those um, resources. And we're going to talk some about the, the spirit of motivational interviewing or another way to say that. It's just our style and our world view. And then we're going to look together at an activity that promotes um, one of the important components of that spirit, which is partnership. So we're going to look together about at this activity we could do that you could do with your clients or patients that you serve, and we'll think together about how, um, how you might put that into practice. So what is motivational interviewing? I think it's important to start out with uh, getting on the same page about that definition. The name motivational interviewing doesn't necessarily uh, lend itself to a quick and common understanding of what it is we're actually talking about. Um, when I hear the phrase motivational, the first thing I think of is like a motivational speaker. And so that's someone who is going to um, you know, inspire me and um, motivate me from an external source, um, something maybe their life story or a speech they're going to give or a movie I'm going to watch that I'm going to find motivating. Um, and interviewing really talks about, you know, when I go into an interview, the purpose of that is for the, for the person doing the interview to gather information. Neither of those are really a great picture of what motivational interviewing is all about. Um, although, you know, we certainly do get good quality information when we use our motivational interviewing techniques, the purpose of us using motivational interviewing is not just to gather information. And our, our, our purpose in, in using an MI approach with someone is not for us to provide them with external motivation. It's really focused on identifying what their internal motivation might be and then helping them utilize that internal motivation and apply it to the particular change that we're just, that we're helping them work with. Um, so a definition is that motivational learning is a collaborative, person-centered guiding method designed to elicit and strengthen motivation for change. There's a lot of jargon packed into that definition. So here's a, a more sort of plain language way of thinking about it. Motivational interviewing is a way for us to structure our conversations. And we use it when we have the goal of helping the other person think about change. And when we're using motivational interviewing, we're trying to help the other person talk themselves into the change, which is a bit of a significant shift. Um, I think for a lot of us in the healthcare field, in helping professions, we get very much in the habit of talking the other person into change. So we're trying to persuade them and convince them and twist their arm and cajole them and encourage them. Um, but we're trying to do all of that heavy lifting as opposed to helping them identify what it is 
internally about themselves, about their values, their priorities, the things that matter to them, what is it about that that could be motivation for them? <clears throat> so like I said, our goals in motivational interviewing, what are we trying to accomplish every minute of our interaction with the other person when we're doing MI, is we're trying to engage the other person. We want to connect with them. Um, we want to establish a positive working relationship. And so there's a lot about motivational interviewing that is very person-centered. Um, and isn't necessarily unique to motivational interviewing. Person-centered approaches are found in lots of different um, uh, practices, but that is our foundation always in motivational interviewing is being connected with the other person in a, in a meaningful way. We're also always working on reducing resistance. Um, sometimes that looks like resistance to making a change, right? So. Um, the person who has been smoking for a long time might say, you know, I don't even want to try because I know it's going to be too hard. That's resistance to a change. Um, and we also sometimes experience resistance just to us and our, our relationship with the person or the work we're trying to do. And that might be, you know, someone saying like, well, what do you, who are you to tell me anything about my smoking? What do you know about what it's like to live my life? This is a slightly different flavor of resistance, and we would call that discord. Um, but that is also um, a type of resistance that we work to reduce. We do that in a couple different ways, both proactively. We try to set our relationships up in ways that are least likely to invite that resistance. And then we have some specific techniques and, and strategies for dealing with it and addressing it and resolving it when it shows up in our inner inner in our interactions because even if we do everything right it's going to show up some of that resistance um, to just making a change is part of the normal change process and then the third thing that we're keeping our eye on at all times as as one of our objectives or goals when we're doing a motivational interviewing is this concept of change talk which is a key concept in motivational interviewing Change talk is identified as anything the other person says that would come as their argument for making a change. So any of their reasons, any of their hopes, any of um, their fears about what might happen if they don't change, all of that counts as change talk as long as the other person doesn't, um, as long as it comes from the other person. So as long as it's something they're saying, not something I'm saying to them. Um, and so we work very hard to draw that out to create opportunities for the other person to give voice to that in our interaction. So like I said, we're, we're just going to very briefly cover the evidence base for motivational interviewing. Um, this is a pretty busy graph here, but I think it shows a little bit of sort of the historical progression of motivational interviewing. You'll see it starts down in 1988, and the first few um, studies were published in that first time period between 1988 and 1994. Um, and as you can see by looking at the colors, those first studies and where motivational interviewing was first really developed was in the treatment of alcohol and other drugs. So that treatment um, condition is somewhere where, you know, typically the idea that patients aren't ready to change, don't want to change, making changes is hard, you know, that was all there, and motivational interviewing developed in that context. As you note, though, if you look over to the next little time frame there from 1995 to 99, that next bar graph starts to get much more colorful. So very quickly people started saying, hey, there seems to be something pretty powerful about this approach. If it works in that area, if it works with those patients, I wonder if it might work with the population I serve. I wonder if it might work for some other conditions and some other clinical concerns. So we quickly start to see things such as health promotion, diabetes, cardiac um, rehabilitation, HIV STD risk, smoking and tobacco cessation, um, all the way back down, you know, and we still see a significant bump in the research 
um, continues in the alcohol and drug treatment field, but it starts to spread very quickly to other conditions and other concerns and other populations. This uh, graph kind of cuts off at 2009, and I, I didn't make the original one, so I don't, uh, it would be quite an undertaking for me to create that next time frame. But what I can tell you is that we are now well over 200 clinical control trials, um, which are sort of con considered the, the gold standard um, in research studies, looking at motivational interviewing in just a wide variety of areas. Um, pretty much you name it, someone's been researching it or studying it or publishing about it um, in terms of the work. As long as there's a component involved where we need the patient to take some active role that's different from what they've typically been doing, so they have to start doing something, stop doing something, do something differently, um, there's, there's generally a room there for motivational interviewing. So it's great that there's been a lot of studies. My question always is, well, what do we know? Based on a whole bunch of research has been done, lots of research time and money has been invested in motivational learning. So what do we know about it based on that? So in general, all the studies find that motivational learning improves, uh, what we say, retention, adherence, and outcomes across, across a wide range of behaviors. So, the amount of time people stay in treatment, how closely they follow treatment plans, and then their outcomes are all improved with the application of motivational interviewing or the addition of motivational interviewing. We also know that motivational interviewing generalizes fairly well across cultures. Uh, this is not just sort of a Midwest, white, middle class uh, type of intervention. Motivational interviewing is international. It's been trans, the materials, have been translated and are being trained in 43 different languages. Um, every continent of the U.S. has trainers um, and people utilizing motivational interviewing in their work. So it, it really does generalize fairly well across cultures. We also know that change talk, which we already talked about, the amount of uh, the amount of talking that we can get the other person to do about their arguments for change. And then sustained talk, which is the opposite of that, so the amount of talking that the person does about their reasons for not changing or their arguments for not changing, we know that both of those impact outcomes. More change talk is generally found to be associated with better outcomes, and more sustained talk is found to be associated with worse outcomes. And that's true whether the person, you know, walks in the door with a whole laundry list of reasons why they're wanting to make the change, or if they walk in fairly ambivalent and unsure about the change, but through the course of our conversation, we're able to generate more and more change talk out of them. We see the outcomes improve. We also know that we can control how much change and sustained talk happen in our conversations. Partly it's what we focus on, what we reflect, and partly it's what we ask for from the other person. So bottom lining it for you, does it work? Um, a meta-analysis back in 2010 looked at motivation interviewing across, you know, lots and lots of studies and found that in about 75% of the studies, they found that there was um, improvement in the motivation interviewing condition above and beyond any other thing that it was being compared to. Um, of that 75%, um, about 50% of it is sort of moderate changes, um, more, but still, you know, statistically significant. And 25% of that were, were really um, meaningful, significant, substantial changes. So it works for a lot of people. Sometimes its impact is more subtle than others. And there is, seems to be a segment of the population that motivational interviewing is not enough to have the full impact that we would hope to see. So we're going to talk just briefly about the world view of motivational interviewing or sort of the, the general approach. So typically in our healthcare settings, in our helping professions, we utilize what's been termed a deficit approach. So that sounds a little meaner than it is, but really what it means is that we're focusing on the problem. 
um, which makes sense, right? If someone comes into the emergency room, we need to very quickly zero in on what's the problem and how do we fix it. Where we see that this deficit approach can get in the way of having engaged, empowered patients is when we look at more of those chronic conditions or those areas where we need them to be an active partner. They're not just laying on a gurney and letting us work on them. We need them engaged. So what happens is the deficit approach really looks at, okay, this person isn't changing. So it kind of asks the theory, it asks the question, what's the matter? Why isn't this person changing? And so we make a series of assumptions using this deficit approach. Maybe the person doesn't know. Maybe they don't understand. Maybe they don't know how to do these things they're, they're being required to do. Maybe they just don't care about their health. Or perhaps, you know, they're in denial, like they can just um, go along and not um, take their medication and everything will be fine, right? Maybe they're completely in denial. So then we, based on those assumptions about what the problem might be or where the deficit might lie, we make some, some uh, decisions about our role, right? So our role then as the helper might be to educate them. It might be to inform them. It might be to persuade them. We're trying to, you know, use some scare tactics or twist their arm in some way. And we generally are working then to provide what's missing, right? So in this, the metaphor for this is that it's a cup and the glass is not all the way full, right? So we're focusing on the empty part of the glass as opposed to, you know, what's there. We're focusing on how much is empty and what can we do to fill up that space. So in that metaphor, then, we're functioning as the faucet. And in some scenarios, that works perfectly. Right? In some scenarios, it really is that the there's just some information missing. And when, if we can do a little education, a little informing, maybe a little teaching, now that that information is there, the patient is able to act differently, problem solved. In a lot of instances, at least for me in my experience, it has felt like I am a faucet and I am pouring out everything I have to give and then some into, these, into this other patient and gosh darn it, there must be a hole in the bottom of the cup or something because they are not making changes. I don't know if any of you have had a similar uh, experience or ever felt that way with any particular patients or clients. Um, but I certainly have. So we have to think about in those instances where it doesn't seem like it's just a missing piece of information or just a resource I can connect them with. You know, if someone legitimately just needs help with transportation and I can help them with transportation, there we go. That's it. But if a lot of times the needs are beyond that, and so then we have to think about how can we utilize what's been called a competence approach. So this focuses a little less on what's missing or what's wrong. Now, it is important. I've had people ask, well, how do you, you know, resolve anything if you don't ever pay attention to what's wrong? It's, we're not saying that you have to totally turn a blind eye to where the deficits might be using this competence approach. It's just about where the majority of our focus is and where we focus first. Because that gives a message to the patient about what our priorities are. If we're spending a lot of time identifying the problem, that sends a message to the patient that they are part of the problem. They're the problem. Versus here, in the competence approach, we focus first on what matters to the other person. What are they bringing to the equation? So what are their strengths? What are their values and their priorities? What resources do they already have? What is their perspective on the situation? What experiences have they had in the past that maybe can inform the current situation? So we focus first on what matters to them, and then that really shapes our role to be something a little different. Instead of providing what's missing, we're working to be a good partner to them. So we're trying to listen with the intent of understanding we might reflect back some key themes or trends that we notice. Um, from our perspective, we can ask those good, stimulating questions that really get them thinking in, the, in a useful direction. Um, 
And that doesn't exclude the possibility of doing those other things like teaching and educating and informing and providing, but we want to first establish this, um, this partnering role where we're really giving honor to the other person's competencies. And so in this metaphor, we're going to, we look at every glass and we can't see what's in there, but we have always assume that there's some water in the glass. And no matter where that water level is, whether it's almost to the top or just a tiny drop at the bottom, we want to function as that straw that is going to draw up what's, what's there and, and help to point it in a useful direction. So this is our confidence approach, and we try to lead with this. It's very similar to a strength-based approach, so some of that may sound very familiar to some of you. And then this shapes our whole worldview in motivational interviewing. So our worldview has these, you know, basic assumptions. People are competent. They generally have some self-knowledge, attitudes, and capabilities that can affect change. So reminding, I often have to remind myself that people can and do change all the time, even really hard changes without any professional intervention at all whatsoever. Every day, right now at this very moment, there are lots of people out in the world just making some changes because they figure out that something needs to change and they make those changes. So our main focus then is not to be the force behind that change, but just to sort of step out of the other person's way and sometimes help them step out of their own way, but focus on being present with them, being a partner to them in a way that is going to support that change and sometimes facilitate that change, but not be the um, engine, the driver behind that change. We always want the other person to do that. So when we talk about the spirit of motivational interviewing, there are four main components that make up that spirit. Um, so. There's a couple different acronyms, because why could we keep it simple? One is PACE, so if you read it backwards, Partnership, Acceptance, Compassion, and Evocation, PACE. Um, the other one is CAPE, so if you start at the bottom with Compassion, Compassion, Acceptance, Partnership, and Evocation. If you're not the kind of person that remembers things well with a mnemonic device, that is perfectly fine. Ignore those two things. You don't have to think about CAPE or PACE. Um, and you can just think about the concepts, right? Because the concepts are so much more important than the jargon. I don't care if you remember that it's partnership or if you think about, if you just remember and focus on the idea of, you know, we're equal partners. I'm an expert on some stuff, but the other person is really an expert on other stuff as well. So I'm going to negotiate that agenda and our goals together in a, in a partnering way. I'm going to help them always evaluate their options. I'm going to often explicitly tell the patient things like, I know some stuff about, you know, taking care of patients with diabetes, but you're the expert on your own life, and you know quite a bit about what's going to work for you and what's not going to work for you and how we can make this a plan that's really going to meet your needs. So identifying them explicitly as a partner and as an expert. And then often what that takes for us as professionals is holding back on our advice giving and our expertise. It doesn't mean letting go of them, and it doesn't mean, um, you know, ignoring that, but it does mean that sometimes we have to hold back and not jump right in to start with the teaching or the advice giving. Before we know, is that really targeted? Is that is that really going to be a useful thing or not? Um, I'll give you an example um, from my own life. So I have been recommended to be on a low-sodium diet, and I met recently with um, – it's actually the pharmacist who is sort of does a lot of that lifestyle coaching as well. And so she asked me, you know, how's the, how's the low-sodium diet going? And I told her, you know, um, for me it was – what I did was a lot of research up front, and so I feel like I have myself set up really successfully right now. So I looked up, you know, the common, like I have little kids at home, so I looked up the meals that they most frequently ask for, and then I found the lowest possible sodium options, found some 
lower sodium ways to cook mac and cheese, and I found the lowest sodium, um, you know, of the couple other favorite things they have. And then I kind of planned my meals to be really, um, really low sodium to start with. So as a baseline, like I figured out what can I have. I, I like routines, so I figured out what are my two choices I could have for breakfast. They're going to be, you know, keep me, you know, under 500 milligrams of sodium. What are some good options for lunch? So I have a drawer full of tuna fish with low sodium mayonnaise, and I'll be happy to eat that every day of the week, you know. And then in the evenings, I have sort of our list of meals that I know I can eat, and I always make sure to have those things on hand. And I went and I bought a bunch of the salt-free spices, you know, so I'm telling her all of these things. And so then she said, well, are you tracking in your little book. And I said, well, you know, I'm not tracking it um, every day. I did for a while, and I kind of have fallen off on that tracking. And so then she said, you know, I want to tell you a little bit about um, nutrition labels. And I thought that was a little strange because, you know, I kind of already know how to read a nutrition label. But so she drew a little nutrition label on her sheet and, you know, wrote out, you know, sodium and then said like, you know, 200 milligrams. And she then said, okay, now if you looked at this, how many milligrams would you think was in, let's say this is a can of soup, how many milligrams would you think is in this can of soup? And then she didn't even let me answer. <laughs> and she said, now most people think like, oh, I can just eat this can of soup and the soup, the can of soup has 200 milligrams of sodium and so that's a good low sodium option. So, but what you don't know is that you have to look at the serving size. And so, you know, then she sort of drew a little further up on the nutrition label and wrote, you know, serving size three. And she said, now, you're, you know, that's them saying that you um, are only supposed to eat one-third of this can of soup, and that's one serving. But this, it's kind of a small can, so what happens if you eat, all, if you eat the whole can of soup at, at lunch? And I said, well, I would eat 300, 600 milligrams of sodium. And she was like, yes, now let me do another one. And so even though I was showing her, like, that I understood the concept, she continued to try. She had, like, her little lesson. And once once she got rolling on that lesson, I, you know, I had to sit through, like, three more lessons of different, you know, labels. Now, I think that's a great patient education tool. I love that she's making sure that patients understand how to navigate that rather than just saying, um, here's a low-sodium diet, follow it. However, or, you know, what the physician said was, you know, stay under this many milligrams of sodium a day and then sort of left me to figure it out on my own. I'm a pretty health-savvy person, and I'm, you know, my mother was a home ec teacher, so I'm very familiar with nutrition labels, and I was able to figure it out on my own, and I understand that not a lot of patients might be. But what would be a more partnering approach might have been to ask about what I understood, to let me demonstrate my own expertise first, and then hold back on her own advice giving and her own expertise, which clearly she had a good understanding of it, but that's that, what that temper advice giving and expertise bullet talks about is holding back and saying, like, let me explore first what the patient knows and understands, and then I'll fill in the gaps as they're needed. Um, so that's an example of how, you know, she was very kind about it. She was very partnering about it. Um, I mean, I guess she wasn't very partnering about it. She was very kind about it. She was very supportive around it. Um, she wasn't, you know, trying to shame me in any way, but it kind of left me feeling like, gosh, she doesn't think I'm very smart <laughs> because she had to, you know, over explain that to me. And it was, you know, a little frustrating to waste 10 minutes of my time learning something I already knew. So thinking about what pieces of your expertise and education and advice giving, are you, how are you able to hold back on that a little bit until you figure out whether that's really what the missing piece is for the patient in making a change. The second component of the spirit of MI is this acceptance. So that's the A. And we really want, this really focuses on the other person being the decider, right? They are in control of their choices. 
even if the choice might be something that we really don't want to see them make that choice, it's an unhealthy choice, ultimately they get to decide what they choose to do. Um, so what we find is that it's a little bit of a paradox, but if we remind them of that freedom and highlight that for them in our interaction, they're much less likely to want to push back and feel like they're creating their own choices, right? They're, they feel more in control of the situation. If we say things like, you know, here's what we really recommend, of course, ultimately what you decide to do is up to you, and I'm going to support you no matter what, um, but in your situation, this is what would be safest and healthiest, right? And so if we say things like that and really highlight that sense of control and their freedom of choice, we find that you can um, diffuse a lot of that pushback that people, um, people in general just don't like to be told what to do. And so this um, sometimes can help diffuse that a little bit. And then um, acceptance is just also about that unconditional, this is a very count of counseling term, but it's unconditional positive regard. And that basically, the, the less, the more, more common plain language way to say that is unconditional love, right? So that means that we are going to value and um, appreciate and prize the patients we work with, whether they make the choices we want them to or not. So that's the acceptance component, and then there's compassion. And that just really talks about how we're using motivational interviewing when we're focused on the well-being of the other person, not for any other reason, you know, because we're trying to make a fail or meet some other goal. And then evocation, and that talks about drawing out from the other person. So we want to be curious and hear about their thoughts about the change, their perspective on the situation, um, and not just rely on that education or information as a way to help them change. We want to draw them out and explore with them why that change, how that change fits into their life. So we're going to go through, I'm going to talk you through a little bit of an activity that we can do um, that really supports partnership up front with the patient or client. Um, this is something that you could utilize at an initial visit with someone. This is also something you could utilize at the beginning of, your, of each visit with the other person. So this is a very flexible tool. I find that it's very helpful, um, particularly for patients who might not be, um, who might um, who might be having some cognitive difficulties or just, you know, feeling overwhelmed because it is a visual tool that you can actually write down on a piece of paper. So this is called agenda setting. And the way this would work, so this is one example here, um, and this is my recreation of one. I worked with an organization that was doing some fault prevention. And so they had this um, in, in their their main Priority was false, but their their overarching goal was to keep um, older patients safely in the home um, as long as they could and to reduce the number of ER calls and ER visits um, for that older adult population. So the, they decided that, you know, they had room for eight things on their agenda at their initial visit. And they would talk about, you know, these are the things we generally work with people on. Um, and <clears throat> the way this works is you would introduce it to say, like, this this page or this chart um, kind of helps us think about planning our time together. So on here you'll notice some pictures that represent the things that I most commonly am talking to the patients I work with about. And then you'll notice that some of the circles are, are blank, and those are the ones where I want to hear from you what are your priority areas, what are the things that you think it would be important for us to talk about um, either on this visit or in our future visits together. And so a lot of times we see this filled out with just words, so you don't have to have it pre-produced. You can have it all blank and then write it in, you know, write in the things you typically work with people on, or... If it's not the same for every person, you could, you know, for you on this visit, these are the things I want to get to today. I want to hear about your medication. You could write meds. I want to hear about how the visit with the social worker went. You could write social worker. 
and then, you know, what questions do you have, and you could let them fill in the empty ones. There's nothing magical about the number of circles on the page. Um, if you have a short amount of time with someone, you might reduce the number of circles. What we do want to make sure to do in the spirit of partnership is have at least equal number circles blank for them as we have filled in for us. So my agenda should be equal to theirs or more circles for them. You know, if I had an odd number, I would want to have, uh, if there were just seven, I would want to have um, three of mine and four of theirs. So in this example, um, the way I would present it is, you know, this the sheet often helps me plan my helps us plan our time together. These are the things I most frequently talk to patients about when I come and visit them in the home. Um, so we'll look at the ones that have some pictures and then the empty ones I want you to be thinking about what are your priority items, what's on your agenda that you think it would be useful for us to talk about. So you'll notice there's one with a yummy looking sandwich on there. So we like to talk about, you know, what your what your diet is like, how you, how your food is, how your you know, how grocery shopping is going, how cooking is going, do you eat meals with other people, what needs do you have in that area. You know, the, the one underneath it has a picture of a pill bottle, and so I often talk with patients or clients about their medication. Um, how are you getting your medication filled? How are you keeping track of it? How do you feel like it's going? What do you think is working well? What isn't working well? Those are all things that we could talk about in that medication area. We also, you'll notice looking at the other bottom corner, we talk about keeping you safe in the home because we don't want you to have to have steps or tripping hazards or things that are going to make your home harder for you to navigate and be safe in. So oftentimes one of the things I'll do is a walkthrough of your house with you to look and see what can we do to help make it as safe as possible for you in your home environment. And then the last one that I have filled in as a picture is we always talk about support. So who do you have around you? Um, family, friends, who are you interacting with on a regular basis? Is it, you know, individuals at your church? What are you doing in terms of social support and just feeling like you're connected to people who are important to you? So those are the four things that I find are commonly things I'm talking to patients about. I want to hear from you now. What do you think we should fill in that might be more specific and particular to you? What are your priority items? And then as they tell me, I would just fill them in, literally writing them in on the circle. Um, and then I might say to them, okay, so today we have some paperwork we have to get to with our first visit. In addition to that paperwork, we probably have time to talk about one or two of these circles. So which one do you think you want to make sure we address today? And then let them give a choice. And so this is a way that we can sort of manage our time, be very upfront and transparent about our time, and also think about getting my needs met, but also getting the other person's needs met. And when we do that upfront, it really sets our relationship up in a positive way. This is just one tool of many. Um, but this is a tool that I think um, I have found to be pretty useful. So what we're asking you to do between now and two weeks from now when we have our follow-up meeting is you will be receiving an email after this call that um, has connected to it a handout. And on that handout, there's a, an individual worksheet just for you to do a little um, thinking about change processes and the change process in general. And then there's a copy, a blank one of these, so it doesn't have my lovely pictures in there. So you can either create your own, draw, write in what your common things are. You could find, you could um, take it and add some clip art, which is, you know, kind of how this one was made. Um, on the computer, you could uh, cut, thing, cut pictures out of a magazine and collage it. You could do whatever feels like it's going to be the best fit for you. Make it your own. Um, and then partner with a coworker um, to plan your own version of that worksheet and then practice, you know, how you'll introduce it to the patient, how you might bring it up, when you might use it. And we're invite, we're asking everyone to try to at least give that a go with at least one patient that you work with between now, in the next two weeks. 
so that hopefully coming back to our next follow-up um, webinar, what we're going to start with is talking about what did you find when you worked your way through that individual worksheet and what was your experience like when you tried the agenda setting um, process, what worked, what didn't work, what did you notice, what was that like for you. So that's where we're going to start next time is just what your experiences are putting some of this into practice. And then we will go over some more MI um, strategies and techniques, and we'll talk a little bit and practice a little bit about reflective listening. So here's my contact information. If you have questions in the meantime, um, if you want me to send you a different version than the one you get in the email, um, if you need help finding some pictures that work, if you want to hear about some research in a particular area, you can always give me a call or email me. And at this point, we have a few minutes, so we are going to open up. Uh, John, if you can open up the lines or remind us, actually, how to open the lines, you can either type in questions or comments or feedback, things you'd like to hear about on the next webinar, into the chat box, or you can follow the directions Jonathan's going to give you in just a minute about how to open up your line and ask them um, on the audio. Thank you. If you do have a question, press star than one on your touchtone phone. I have no audio questions at this time. And we have a question from Charleston Hill. Please go ahead. Hi, what's your question or comment? Ms. Charlie, your line is open if you did have a question or comment. And we have no further questions at this time. Okay, well, we will give you about five minutes back in your day then. I know that's always a hard thing. Um, so we'll, we will wrap up. Just be on the lookout for that email. You should be receiving it today. I would say if you haven't received it by Monday, shoot me an email um, or any of the other emails that you have. I think you have um, Jen Yonke's email as the coordinator of this. But if for some reason, you know, the email gets caught in your spam filter or anything, just shoot us an email so we can get you those activities. And we look forward to talking with you again on in two weeks on Thursday, August 2nd, at the same time, um, 12 Central, 1 o'clock Eastern time. Thank you. Ashley, I don't know if you have anything, any other concluding remarks. No, no, you summed it up nicely. Thanks to you, Mia. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That concludes today's call. Thank you for participating, and you may now disconnect.